Hey, welcome back, Emmanuel, to Online Worship. We're excited about today and our time together as we continue along our Pilgrim's Progress with Christian. And we are on site with the actual Hill of Difficulty for today's service. Emmanuel, we're so excited that outdoor in-person services are beginning October 4th at 8 a.m. Be sure to check social media and a mailbox near you for all the very important details. Reservations are required. We look forward uh, for those that are able to come to see you. But don't worry, our online services are gonna continue every Sunday throughout the pandemic. All I wanna do is a zoom, zoom, zoom. There are great Zoom opportunities today at 9.30 Christian Education for Adults and then at 11.30 we're having our virtual coffee hour on Zoom. Please join us there. Next week, October 4th, is World Communion Sunday. Be sure to check uh, the church for information about the special offering that we take for this service and as we celebrate the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. We are one bread one body in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's now enjoy worship together. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Good and gracious God, all that we have comes from you. Make us sensitive in all our dealings with each other and with your whole creation. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we might share it with others. Please bless our worship of you today. Amen.
Please join us now in the call to worship. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Let us worship the living God. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me 
This week, we asked children, how do you know that Jesus is with you? Let's see what they had to say. JJ, how do you know Jesus is with you? Because he's my best friend. Because he makes some breakfast for me. Okay. But, 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 but Jesus doesn't have a phone. He doesn't have a phone? Mm -mm. So how do you talk to him? So you can talk to people on magic. And I love him. He's the best, best ever. Yay! <laughs> I know this is in my heart because I pray with him at night and during the day. He's in the air. Okay, Elsie, how do you know Jesus is with you? Jesus helps us. How? He, he gave us God. Uh, God. And... He loves us, and he does. He do, he does love people a lot because I feel it in my heart, and I feel like a movie. Like a movie? No, a movie. Oh, you're moving. Does it feel good? Yep. Paul wrote so many letters to churches, helping them in their faith. Today in our scripture reading, he's reminding the Romans and us that when things get tough, when we have problems, we can use what we've lived through to learn, to become stronger, to have hope. Better days are coming right around the corner. God is right there with us, cheering us on. We can even cheer each other on. Go, Emmanuel! You can do this! Please join me in prayer. Oh God, by your Spirit, tell us what we need to hear. Show us what we ought to do and empower us to do it. All through Christ Jesus, our crucified, risen, and reigning Lord. Amen. Well, last week we saw how Christian was finally able to be released of his burden when he account encountered the cross beside the Holy Way. His burden rolled down the mountain and went into the empty tomb never to be seen again. But Christian's pilgrimage is far from over. In many ways, it's just beginning. Not far past the cross, he found three men that were sleeping along the road, and their ankles were chained together. Their names were Sloth, Simple, and Presumption. Christian hoped to awaken them from their slumber and to help them be loosed from their chains and to join him on his journey to the celestial city. But they would have none of it, and they kept sleeping. Now, as Christian continued on the holy way, 
he encountered two new travelers. Their names were Formality and Hypocrisy. They were from the land of vainglory. And so they came from a different way from Christian. Finding a shortcut, they scaled a wall rather than entering through the wicked gate, as Christian was instructed by evangelist. Formality and hypocrisy poked fun at Christian for sticking to the travel directions that were given him. So Christian walked a little ahead of them along the way, reading from his book as he walked, to refresh his spirit and to help him overcome the discouragements of his day. Well, it wasn't long before the three came upon the hill of difficulty. It was long and it was steep. The holy way went straight up the hill. However, two roads diverged around the hill of difficulty. One was named danger and the other destruction. Now both formality and hypocrisy thought that these two ways bypassed the hill of difficulty, that it would get them to the back end of the hill and that it would reconnect with the holy way. And so they decided to take the easier route. Formality choosing danger, hypocrisy, destruction. Neither was seen again. Now, Christian chose the holy way up the hill of difficulty. He first drank from the fresh spring at the foot of the hills, and then he began running straight up the hill. And as as he made his ascent, he began singing, I must climb to the mountaintop. Never mind if the path is steep, for I know that through strife lies the way of life. And the wayfarer must not weep, so courage, my heart, don't faint, don't fear. Though the rough rock makes the way slow, the easy track only leads me back. Up and on is the way I must go. But soon Christian's progress began to slow down considerably. He went from a run to a walk and then crawling upon his hands and knees, for the way was very steep. When Christian was about halfway up the hill of difficulty, he saw that there was a very pleasant, shady place where he could lay down and rest. And as he rested, he gazed upon his nice new clothes that were given to him by the shining ones. And as he drifted off to sleep, the scroll that he was given fell out of his hand. Now, sometime later, there was a voice that awoke Christian. He arose with a jolt and then continued on his way. Soon, two men came darting at Christian, going in the wrong direction. Turn back! Turn back! There's lions ahead! yelled Mistrust. The further we go, the more dangerous it is, explained Fearful. We made it up to the hill of difficulty, but the journey just kept getting more and more treacherous. So we turned around and were heading back home. You make me afraid, said Christian, but I would rather face dangers ahead than dangers, certain dangers, back in my city, for I will certainly perish there. I must press onward. To go back is nothing but death. To go forward, I fear death, but I know that life everlasting is beyond it. Fearful and mistrust just shook their heads and they ran down the hill of difficulty. To find comfort, Christian reached for the scroll in his pocket, but there was nothing in his empty pockets. Panic flooded over him and Christian became distressed. Then he remembered resting halfway up the hill of difficulty and that he must have lost his scroll there. Without delay, he began searching and praying as he backtracked, sighing and weeping. How could I sleep in the midst of difficulty and in the daytime? I've had to walk this hill of difficulty three times now, back and forth instead of just once, like Israel wandering in the wilderness. Finally, he arrived at that shady space of rest. Christian sat down there and he wept. But when he looked down upon the ground, his eyes fell upon his scroll. Hope returned to Christian. 
with his scroll now safely tucked away in his pocket, strength and even joy accompanied him on the rest of his climb up the hill of difficulty, even as Christian nervously looked all around for the beasts of prey. Let's hear now from our scripture reading from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope in sharing in the glory of God. And not only that, we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God endures forever. 2020 has felt like one long obstacle course, hasn't it? And then reading the Pilgrim's Progress and about Christian's adventures and challenges in the book, it reminds me of how our own spiritual journey is oftentimes like an obstacle course too. Challenge after challenge has come our way. Now the good news is this, that hope is going to help us. It's going to help us make it, us make it through our difficulties. We're going to do this, Emmanuel, with God's help and God's hope. You see, by the grace of God, we are justified by faith, Paul says. Meaning that in Christ, our relationship with God is no longer strained or estranged. Before, we were enemies, but now we are God's friends. The relationship between the creator and the creature, and between the creature and the creature has been repaired, restored, and reconciled in Christ Jesus. You see, God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. God has now empowered us by the Spirit to carry out His intentions for us. So, because we're justified, Paul says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, life doesn't have to be tranquil or calm to experience the peace of God. In fact, peace is for times of upheaval and chaos. The peace of God is independent of our circumstances. It's sturdy. In fact, the rough and tumble, the uh, wear and tear makes hope stronger than it was before rather than weaker. Now, I don't know about you, but this gives me hope in my life. See, hope is based upon a higher plane than our circumstances. Hope is grounded not in whatever the weather system in our society happens to be or in our individual lives. Our hope is grounded in God who is eternal and unchanging. It's built on nothing less than Christ the solid rock. That's where our hope is. We can trust and believe, even in the midst of our trials and tribulations, um, we can have hope. We can even be merry when there's no merriment going on. You see, this is the beauty of the gift of faith, hope, and love that God imparts to us. Our obstacles become stepping stones. Demolition becomes construction. Obstruction becomes an intersection. Darkness becomes light. Defense becomes offense. Crucifixion becomes resurrection. In God we trust, not in our circumstances we trust. In God we trust. Now, even when we're trusting and we're hoping in God, there are times and seasons of doubt for the Christian. Even when we're trying so hard, with hope, though, we may have times of doubt, but it's in God that we doubt, in God that we trust. Yet, doggedly, we believe that hardship is infused with meaning for the Christian. 
It's in the crucible that we encounter the cross of Christ. It's in the crucible that we encounter the risen Christ. You see, crucifixion and resurrection are both found in the crucible. Now, I don't know if you've seen those pestles and mortars. The pestle is the cross that grinds. And the mortar is the bowl of the empty tomb. We are being pressed down by the cross into the mortar of the empty tomb by the pestle. That is our hope, Emmanuel, that life comes out of death. Life comes out of that pressing down that we experience through affliction. As Karl Barth says, this is not an achievement of our spirit, but the action of the Holy Spirit given to us. So it's through Christ that all these things are possible. Christ's actual presence and Christ's actual influence are at work in you and in me as we speak. Trust and believe. It's this hope that helps us to stand the test and then remain standing afterwards. So Christ is at work in us and he gives us the gumption and he gives us the guts to face our obstacles head on rather than fleeing from them, rather than ignoring them or pretending that they don't exist. So the key is Christ. Christ opens up the door to God's presence that had been previously closed and locked. Christ then ushers us into the court of the king. And when we come before the throne in God's presence, we experience not judgment or criticism. Rather, we experience grace, God's kindness, God's open arms. This grace that Paul talks about in which we stand, this grace in which we live, it equips us and it empowers us for all that life and death throws our way. Grace frees us where we can be honest with ourselves and honest with our situation. We don't have to be in denial. We don't have to be super spiritual and pretend that a situation isn't challenging or painful. We can admit that it is. But we also have the hope of God's help. That something redemptive is going on in the midst of our very real struggles and difficulties in our lives. Our difficulties are not meaningless or purposeless. Our difficulties are actually refining us. They're burning away the impurities of our lives, making us like sterling silver. You see, when we find ourselves in the pressure cooker in our lives, there is growth that is taking place. It isn't mere subtraction. Purification, not subtraction, is going on. Even a progression is going on. A pilgrim's progression. A pilgrim's purification. And so we can have the audacity, as Paul says, to exult not only in God's glory, but in our hardships. We can rejoice and even boast in our problems because we know that it's about God and God is accomplishing something amazing in us through them. Our victory is assured, even when it looks like we're down for the count. We have good hope for the future, Emmanuel. Nothing less than sharing in God's glory. We are entirely in God's hands. You see, the eyes of faith are able to look through, to penetrate through our affliction, to look through our suffering and to find the meaning in it, to find the meaning in Christ who defeated death. And so it's through God that hardship develops within us patient endurance, as Paul says. We draw from God's unlimited strength rather than our limited resources. The ever-flowing fountain of the Spirit dwells in the church collectively and dwells within the Christian individually. And the Spirit not only hydrates us for our journey, but the Spirit is God's pledge to us, promising us 
that he will see us through to glory. And so it's through God that patient endurance then produces a tried and true character that's been purified by the fire where we're tested and we pass the test. And then it's through God that this very tried and true character then produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. I like how one translation puts it. Such hope is no fantasy. Now Sigmund Freud wrote that human hope is merely just wish fulfillment or a fantasy. Freud wrote that we must um, imagine, just imagine things to be true um, because we greatly wish for them. We want them to happen so bad in our lives that we believe or fool ourselves that they are real. Paul begs to differ with Sigmund Freud. Faith, Paul says, helps us to see the reality beyond our troubles, that Christ has overcome them. You see, two people can be facing the same situation in their lives. One can be driven to despair. The other can be inspired to hope. You see, it's hope that challenges us to the greatness of facing our adversity. Hope refuses to cave in, to give up, to peter out, or to get down. One person put it this way, I don't like crises, but I like the opportunities that they supply. Hope sees the opportunity in the crisis. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, as Paul says, we have a humble confidence, a joyful assurance that we not only will persevere, but we will enjoy God's glory in due time. We know deep down in our heart of hearts that God loves us through thick and thin, no matter what comes our way. God uses and redeems our challenges to make us more tested, more trusting, more mature, more resilient, and more faithful. The Spirit makes us anti-fragile and unshaken by our circumstances. Unshaken so that we can shake things off. Let it roll off your back, Emmanuel, straight into God's loving hands. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question number one. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Take a deep breath and slow down. Be still. Inhale slowly through your nose and hold it for a few seconds. Slowly exhale through your mouth. Hold the emptiness for a moment and breathe deep again. The world wants to steal your peace your mind wants to steal your peace. The evil one wants to steal your peace. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. The world in your mind will steal your peace by what you focus upon. 
Focus on the media bombarding you with images and messages of fear and unrest, and you will receive more unrest. Focus on feelings of fear, anxiety, anger, grief with your thoughts. You will not have peace. So let us seek peace and pray for peace. God, I need your peace now. Silence my thoughts of confusion. Silence my thoughts of anxiety. Silence my thoughts of grief or despair. Silence my thoughts of hurt or anger. When there's chaos or turmoil surrounding me, shelter and protect me, O oh God, with your peace and your loving, powerful presence. Calm me in the storm. Let my mind become like water. When a pebble drops in, the waves ripple out and then the surface becomes still once again. Fill me with your peaceful presence. Rather than going around my difficulties or avoiding my difficulties, help me to stay with them, to face them to go through them, to listen to them, to learn. Embolden me, Spirit of God, to engage them rather than disengage. And now I give them to you. I'm letting go one by one, giving you my pebbles. I am trusting. In exchange, you are helping me to have patient endurance. You are making my character tried and true like Christ. You, O oh God, are instilling in me hope. Like a pitcher, you are pouring into my heart your love, your grace, your strength. Fill me to overflowing with your peaceful presence. I pray this over others in my life I pray this over my enemies. I pray this over my friends. I pray this over leaders. I pray this over the world. With each breath I take, I breathe in your peace that surpasses all understanding. You, O oh God, will keep those in perfect peace because their mind is stayed on you. God, where there is violence, may there be healing. Where there is sickness, may there be wholeness. Where there is hunger and thirst, may there be nourishment. Where there is anger, may there be love. Where there is despair, may there be hope. Where there is fear, may, be, may courage be there. And now let us conclude this guided prayer 
with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now the charge and benediction. Emmanuel, as Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians, we're afflicted, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despondent, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always remember, God's love has been poured into your hearts by the gift of the Holy Spirit giving you an unshakable hope to face, overcome, and shake off whatever comes your way. And now the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you now and always. And all God's pilgrims said, Amen. <laughs>